Logan, which is, I mean, best described as being less a superhero film than a film about aging with arthritis and oh, really? arthritic claws. Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's an X-Men movie for people who prefer Westerns to comic book franchises. It's also a movie for some somebody like me who struggles to remember exactly which character did what and when um, because it's much more stripped down, much more thematic, much more moody, much more melancholic. So it's set some years uh, in the future. There is a date which is mentioned, although it's not entirely clear whether that date is when things are happening. At one point, somebody says 2029, but you're not sure whether that's actually when this thing is playing out. And uh, Logan is now uh, earning a living by the border, working as a limo driver. He looks haggard. He looks ragged. He looks run down. He has bloodshot eyes. Life is not treating him well. He is looking after Charles Xavier, who is suffering from uh, from from spasms, and who, in his later life, as he ha at one point, um, a character says it's, he has a degenerative brain disease in the most dangerous mind in the world. And in order to, uh, if when these things happen, they cause earthquakes. So he has to be constantly medicated, and medication seems to be being available only on the black market. They are living essentially in what looks like a, a, an old water tower in a sort of hidden existence a, away from everything. Every now and then we see Logan becoming Wolverine, but at the beginning of it he appears to be living what just looks like a raggedy and terrible existence only coming into character when it's absolutely demanded. Here's a, here's a clip. Aiden, Mr. Monson. You understand you're trespassing right now, right? I have an easement with the previous owner of your property. <laughs> previous being the operative word. Who's this? Just a guy telling you to get back in your nice truck. Hey, Carl. It looks like Mr. Monson hired some muscle. Looks that way. He's a friend of mine. Friend with a big mouth. I hear that a lot. And you probably hear this too. More than I'd like. And you know the drill. I'm gonna count to three, and you're gonna start walking away. Yeah, right to this one. One. I have a lawyer now. Two. Three. Ah, ah. You yeah, that, boss? <clears throat> you know the drill. Get the hell out of here. I like that. Yeah. So co-written by and directed by uh, James Mangold, and a very, very different kind of movie from the movies which have preceded it. It's a film which uh, invokes Shane, um, which is watched on a television and which is quoted and which circles time and again back to the line, you know, there's no living with the killing. It's a film which owes more to the, the long shadow of, for example, Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven than it does to what you'd usually expect from a superhero movie. Um, there's an awful lot of it which is almost sort of chamber piece dialogue with characters talking about their pasts, talking about their future, talking about the state of mind that they are or are not in. When the violence happens, it's nasty violence. I mean, this is a 15-rated movie and... Um, it's it's a movie which is you know absolutely uh, not designed for the, uh, for the for for the younger viewers. I mean, obviously we've had uh, precedents for this. I mean, you know, Deadpool was uh, was you know, people talked about it being in you know, a sweary, uh, violent superhero movie. And in fact, even if you go back to, I remember when Tim Burton was making the first Batman, and there were stories for a long time that Tim Burton was going to make a kind of dark nighty sort of movie which would be you know 15 or 18 rated or r rated and of course that never happened but now we've passed the tipping point when it is possible to make those kind of movies for a different audience for uh, for an, an adult audience anyway the story then is that he finds himself essentially charged with looking after a strange young girl uh, laura played by daphne king and initially he's completely resistant until um, fate forces his hand and he is forced to essentially take on the responsibility for somebody who are having sort of shed those responsibilities uh, in the past. And what you get is a film which absolutely... Um, is full of sort of you know modern political contemporary references the uh, you know the border the American Mexico border the idea of society being in some kind of decrepit retreat the idea of uh, um, big corporations still being you know conniving and dangerous and yet it is also really a kind of 
a family road movie in a very strange sense, a story about a group of people pulling together and making a, you know, making a journey, a sort of a bid for freedom. It's also prim- primarily a story about living with a legacy and living with a legacy of violence. And as I said, when the violence happens, the violence is full on, full on sort of splattery violence. It's nasty. It's grisly. People get hurt. Um, and yes, you could say on the one hand, this is part of an, you know, an action uh, uh, trope. I mean, for example, we'll look at another movie uh, today, Headshot, in which there's loads and loads of that stuff, but there's not really a sort of sense of pain. I mean, this is a film in which people do get hurt, in which the, one sequence in which we see Wolverine with his claws, which really, really appear to be sort of, you know, giving him jip in the way that your fingers do. I don't know whether you're at this point yet, but when you get to 50 something, you know, playing the piano is not quite as easy as it was before. I because, know, I really struggle. You really do, because that's how you, why you had to give up your, your the, concert. The Moonlight sonata was never quite the same (laughs) and what i particularly liked about it was that it's a film that kind of stood on its own as a piece of cinema so it's got a terrifically uh, interesting score which at some point in an early chase sequence is juggling jazzy piano and strange dysrhythmic drums um it's a film which absolutely is about brutality and is about coming to terms with brutality and about what it means to have... I mean, at times there was moments, and they won't they won't thank me for saying this, in which it kind of reminded me of Blood Father, the movie with uh, Mel Gibson, which I actually rather liked, that kind of, you know, that, that B-movie uh, sensibility. But most impressively, it's a film which stood up on its own as a sort of... I, it sounds weird to even say this, but as, as an intense character study about people facing the end of something, people looking back at something, people attempting to come to terms with something and understanding that there is something. I mean, that line in, it is unforgiving, it's a hell of a thing, killing a man. That's the, and all the way through it, it's those Western references that are right to the fore. I mean, obviously it is also a, you know, a superhero movie. There's a lovely detail in it that the comic books are used as evidence of a fiction some the the young girl has got these comic books and we'll be looking at them going yeah those aren't real that's not what happened you mean there's a there's a fragment of reality in those stories but that's the comic book version of it and you sort of get the sense of that with the film that there's almost like this film is the version that he's talking about as being separate from the other films i was really surprised by how powerful it was 